I want you to turn to uh, Acts chapter 4. Uh, In some ways, we're beginning on kind of a a new emphasis, not really new emphasis, I guess, but a, uh, a passage that's linked together, verse 10, 11, and 12 of chapter 4. And <clears throat> I perceive that it'll be, uh, we'll be spending some time in these three verses. I was not aware of it at the beginning uh, of the uh, investigation of this passage, but as I got into chap- uh, uh, verse 10, which is, of course, a continuation of verse 9, making all one sentence, and then moved into verse 11, I saw that he was really saying the same thing. So the statement in verse 9 and 10 is remade in verse 11, which is then remade in verse 12. And he's just using different words to state the same identical thing, which is typical preacher stuff, just to repeat a lot. So that's exactly what he's doing, and the reason we do that is because you don't get it the first time. (laughs) So, uh, <clears throat> and we're all that way, so uh, God is helping us. So we're kind of launching into that today, uh, beginning at verse 10. You know the scene, of course, a lame beggar uh, who's been that way for 40 years, begging by the gate beautiful, has been marvelously delivered, that moved into a massive crowd gathering and Peter preaching. And then the leaders of Israel got so bent out of shape that they came and erupted the whole meeting and drugged, the, uh, drugged them off to jail. Uh, So Peter and John and the lame beggar, evidently, have been in jail all night. And the big boys, the Sanhedrin, the court, has all gotten together, 70 of them, and some additional powerful individuals who are really interested in this have gathered together, and they have put Peter and John in the middle with the lame beggar uh, who's been healed, and they have started in on them. And they have proposed the question to them in verse uh, 7, Uh, By what power, by what name have you done this? And then you go into Peter's answer, and here's what he had to say. Then Peter filled, this is verse uh, 8, then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit said to them, rulers of the people, elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom you crucified whom God raised from the dead by him this man stands here before you whole this is the stone which was rejected by the builders which has become the chief cornerstone nor is there salvation in any other for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which We must be saved. Reading verse 10. Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him, this man stands here before you whole. Uh, Lord, let us be as focused on you as Peter was. Let us only give one message. As Peter did, let us know only one salvation as you have provided it. May we embrace you in intimate relationship today in this place as never before. May you wrap your arms around us and draw us all together in you. We are listening. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, Verse 10 is an amazing verse. One reason why it's so amazing is because it's absolutely focused on Jesus. And any verse that's focused on Jesus is amazing. However, in some means, every single verse of the Scriptures is focused on Jesus because it all ties into Him and Him alone and is pointing to Him. So the basis of this verse is its total, absolute focus, strong, without questionable without question, focus on Jesus. It probably would be equivalent to John 3.16, except it never got that far in our minds because it was addressed to a Sanhedrin and not to us personally. But John 3.16 is addressed to the world. Therefore, the world, we in the world, got a hold of it. But this says the same identical thing. 
has the same kind of emphasis and has the same kind of amazement that literally reaches out and captures you uh, in its impact. And that's this powerful, powerful verse. Another reason why it's so powerful and amazing is that it reaches back into the Old Testament and it literally gathers together the entirety of everything that's found in the Old Testament and presents it in a summary in one single verse. So if you didn't know anything about the Old Testament at all, if you knew none of the stories, Daniel in the lion's den, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, if you didn't know any of that stuff, Noah, if you didn't know any, Abraham, if you didn't know any of that stuff, if you just had this verse, you would have it all. Because this tells you everything that's going on in the dreams and the desires of the heart of God. In other words, this verse really reaches down inside the very core nature of God and all that he wants for humanity and grabs a hold of it and squeezes it into one overwhelming statement and just hands it to us. That's this verse 10. It is an amazing verse. And what's so incredible about the verse is the fact that the Sanhedrin can get it. And I can really give it to them, and that lets me off the hook, so that's good. But the Sanhedrin didn't get it. And that in itself is amazing because they were the elite, you understand. They are the ones that had the, the ceremonies at their fingertips. They are the ones who had the responsibility of the sacrifices that, that all pointed to this and were all involved in this. They are the ones that had the whole testament flow and the prophets yelling in their ears. So they're the boys that if anybody got it, if anybody would understand this, it should be these boys, but they simply did not get it. And here they are in this scene being told again all over. They simply did not get it. One reason why they didn't get it is because they were totally focused on tradition. And I don't know what to do with that because I have strong traditions in my life. Only to look at those traditions and say, hey, will this blockade me from getting the message of this verse? It certainly did the Sanhedrin. It's awful, ladies and gentlemen, when we become so familiar to things that that familiarity becomes our security. And we will not turn it loose simply because we're familiar with it. We may hate our circumstances. We may dislike the things that are happening to us, but it's all we know. Therefore, we hang on to it even though we're miserable because at least we're secure in our misery. And to step out of that means I got to risk. I got to go into the unknown. I got to trust. I got to expand. But see, God is always doing that to us. He's always coming in the midst of our traditions, the things that have become the patterns in our lives that we are so... We are so secure in, we have always been in, we know this territory, so we are resting in this security of our traditions. And so Jesus has marched into the middle of the traditions of these boys and has literally exploded it in their face, and they refuse to discard anything, they refuse to embrace anything, they discard anything that literally affects or threatens their traditions. Let that soak into your heart. Wouldn't it be awful if you became so familiar with the way you are that you won't turn it loose to let God do something new? Which is exactly the scene that they're in. And they are in a maintenance mode. And I'm telling you from the depths of my heart, maintenance simply maintaining well I'm just putting one foot in front of the other well I'm just barely making it well I'm just maintaining well hey today is going to be like to, yesterday and tomorrow is going to be like today and I'm just barely maintaining that is absolutely destructive to your life it's ruination you weren't built for that man and there is a God who's expanding. There is a God who's taking you and blowing up your traditions. There is a God who's marching into your securities that hamper you and bind you. And he's literally blowing those apart and wanting to take you where you've never been. Is it risky? Not with him. Not with him. It's safe. And he has a dream. But they missed it. 
because they were locked down by the boundaries of their tradition. They missed it because they were all wrapped up in their theology. They were focused on their theology. That scares me because that's my realm. One arm wrestle theology, I win. I can put you down. Hey, I know theology. But wouldn't it be awful that if I had a theology that became a box in my life, which is exactly what that happened to them. They had their theology. They had it all figured out. They put it in a little box. They put a bow on top, set it up on a shelf, said, hey, I know all this stuff. And they had it all down. And they felt comfortable in that and became secure in their theology. Therefore, when God wanted to say something new to them, he couldn't say it because it wasn't in the language or in the framework or in the boundaries of their own theology. And if you never let God speak out of the realm of what you've already figured out in your theology, how's he ever going to tell you anything new? You do realize that theology is what you have figured out. And hey, this may be a newsflash for you, but God is smarter than your brain and he's figured out more than you have. And if you are limited by what you think instead of by what he thinks, and he never can tell you what he thinks because it, it is way beyond what you think, then you are bound and limited by your own thought process and by your theology. And God is bigger than your little theology. And he wants to move on. And again, if God can't, if you'd ever listen to anything that's outside of your theological bounds, how on earth is God ever going to give you new truth and expand it in your life? He's speaking to you. But they missed it. Why? They're focused on their tradition. They're focused on their theology. Of course, they're focused on their theatrics, their performance. We love performance, and of course, we talk a lot about that here, the being over against the doing idea. That Christianity is not about a doing thing. It's not about theatrics. It's not about performance. How well did you perform? God never asked that question. Because this is not about performance. Because performance focuses on me. Performance focuses on how good I am. Performance focuses on, oh, spotlight over here. Perfor performance, per do I have enough make on it? D performance focuses here. And the focus of this whole deal, of this whole verse, is way beyond you and way beyond what you can do and way beyond your performance and way beyond your theatrics. And this is not about you doing and you doing well because that only indicates pride. This is all about relationship. And they weren't into relationship. It's pathetic to read about these guys because they acted but I had nothing inside. And it was strictly an outside action without an in internal heart care and concern. Jesus, you remember, called them white washed sepulchers. Outside, but all oh, the inside. They missed it. They missed it because they were wrapped up in their own performance well what is this new thing he's telling us about this new truth verse 10 probably I must tell you it isn't a new thing it's an old thing so what are you going to hear this morning you're going to hear the same old same old because that's all there is so this is not a new thing this is an old thing, and we can trace it all the way back. But let's walk through his verse. Again, verse 10. Let it be known to you all, unto all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you I want to walk you through the progression of the verse. You start with the Trinity God. Did you notice the statement that he made? Whom God raised from the dead. 
in another study, we indicated this, but the idea is that God is not, this is not a new God. What I'm proposing to you and what he's doing in Jesus and what you're being confronted with is not like, oh, dump the old religion, grab the new religion. This is not like, hey, what you believed in God the Father in terms of the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob, that's all gone now. We're not dealing with that. We're dealing with, Peter says, whoa, guys, whoa, guys, if you think for one single moment we're proposing to you a whole new religion with a whole new God and that Jesus is starting something clear over here uh, uh, in another realm, in another room, on another page, you're dead wrong. This is the fulfillment of, of what God, your God, the God you have counted on from childhood, the God you've heard about, the God that the prophets have talked about, the God that your forefathers have have yelled at you about, the God that is the God of your ceremonies, the God that is the God who told you to sacrifice those lambs that you're sacrificing. That God is the God we're talking about, and that God is the God and that is literally acting in the one called Jesus who literally raised him from the dead. And this is not a new deal at all. This is the same old, same old, but it's expanded in your life, so let it happen, will you? Let it happen. See, we're not proposing that you dump everything that was in the past. We're not proposing you dump your traditions. We're not proposing you set aside your theology. We're not proposing that you do not get involved in acting out your faith. What we're proposing to you is that God wants to take all of those things and he literally wants to expand those and this is not a new deal in any way, shape, or form. This is the same old God that you've had all along. Would you please let him reveal himself in your life? The issue, in the, one of the issues in the evangelical church is the fact that when I say God to you, you immediately think of the Father. God the Father. But biblically, that's not correct. See, in the Old Testament, the wonder of the word Elohim which is always translated God, which is normally translated God, it's always in the plural, which bespeaks the Trinity. Come on, isn't that beautiful? So when you're reading about God in the Old Testament, you're not reading about just the Father. You're reading about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the triune God, the three persons that make up the Godhead, the one God that we have, the three that are one, the one that are three. You're talking about a trinity, folks. Now, you know that there was a problem when they came into the Greek language and wanted to translate it into the Greek because the Greek mythology had all of these disconnected gods. See, the Trinity, triune God, is a united God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They are one. So if you say to us, you believe in three gods, we laugh you out of town because we don't believe in three gods. We believe in one God because the one is three, and the three are so united together that they are one. They act as one. They think as one. They will as one. They are one. No, they're three. The three are one. It's the triune God. You say, I'm confused. Welcome to the real world. Because nobody's figured that out. We understand that. We're not supposed to figure it out. I got that. It's the wonder of truth. So when you read the word God, you can't think about one uh, one person in the Trinity. You have to think about, oh, God, the three in one. And again, when they came into the Greek language to translate it, they translated it singular, theos. Because if they translated a plural, it would be these disconnected gods of the Greek mythology. And that would lead everybody astray. So they didn't do that. They translated it singular. But when you read the word God, you've got to suppose in your mind, you've got to see in your mind, we're really talking about the Trinity God. The God who is literally three in one. Now, why is that so important? Because that's the God that's been acting all the time throughout the Old Testament. That's the God that's been aggressively after your life consistently. That's the God who's totally involved in the man called Jesus. That's the God 
that stuck his fingers in the middle of the history of a world. That God, the three-in-one God. And in our passage, of course, it's focused exclusively on the resurrection. Do you see it? God, Trinity God, raised him from the dead. So it's focused on the resurrection. Now, legitimately, he could have focused on the incarnation. Legitimately, he could have focused on the miracles. He could have focused on any aspect of the life of Jesus because the whole life of Jesus is a result of the Trinity God. The whole Trinity was involved in the incarnation. This is not a father and and, and spirit setting aside saying, there goes that wild kid of ours, Jesus. Doing something crazy. We'll see how it goes. See, that's not what's going on. God the Father is involved in the incarnation. He's the one that's got the angels singing in the sky. The Holy Spirit has come and overshadowed Mary and has literally brought life in her womb. Jesus is literally the babe who is the helpless one now. So all three members of the Trinity are involved, intimately involved in the incarnation. Christmas, we get that, don't we? All the miracles of God, all the miracles of Jesus are literally an outspress of this Trinity God, are they not? Did not Jesus say, hey, what I see the Father do, I do. So everything I'm doing, the Father's already doing because the Father is doing it. Because the Spirit is involved in the doing. So the Father who's moving through the Spirit is moving through me, which involves the whole Trinity in the action of God in the midst of a miracle. So if you're moved upon and a miracle takes place in your life, you can be rest assured that it isn't just Jesus, the second member, who's doing it. It isn't just the Spirit who's actively involved while Jesus is taking a nap. It's the Father, it's the Son, it's the Holy Spirit we're talking about God is involved in this now that whole thing boils down in our passage to the resurrection and when you come to the resurrection the whole Trinity God is involved God raised him from the dead have these things been confusing to you for instance let me take you to Romans uh, chapter 8 verse 11 it says but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to you, to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So where did the resurrection come from? Well, the dynamic activity of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one responsible for resurrection. In fact, I love Acts chapter 2, verse 24, where it talks about Peter's preaching, and he's talking about this Spirit of God that's literally whelming up, running through the bloodstream of Jesus, boiling within his very being, burning in his bones, and just flowing through his life. And this Spirit that's just flowing through him was so powerful in life that that Jesus went clear down into the depths of hell, and hell could not contain him. Why? Because he had this life within him. Wouldn't you like to have that going on inside of you? That's the Spirit. If you're filled with the Spirit, you have it. So that there's less. Oh, death is coming at you on every hand. Destruction is coming at you. Uh, Despondency is coming at you. Depression is coming at you. Criticism is coming at you. But you have this inside moving, powerful life of God just boiling through your being, just permeating your life and pushing back all the... Oh, you got it made. See, why couldn't you be victorious? Why couldn't you live like you ought to? Why couldn't you live in the midst of death? Because life is coming from the Spirit, he said. Let me take you to uh, John 2, 19. Jesus is having quite a discussion with the Israelites, the leaders of Israel, and he he, he begins to say stuff like this. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Now, you know, at his crucifixion, that is, at the trials, they, they leveled that one at him several times. He said, destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up. You know how long it took to build that temple of theirs? And you're going to pop it up in three days, one man on his own? Oh, you didn't get it, guys. I'm not talking about the building temple. I'm talking about my flesh. In fact, he went on to say in John 10, 17 and 18, Therefore my Father loves me because I lay my life down that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me. I lay it down. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it up again. This command I have received from my Father. So who's responsible for the resurrection? 
Well, I thought it was the Holy Spirit. No, no, it's Jesus. So Jesus is responsible for the resurrection. Well, he says the Spirit. Wouldn't it be something if it was both of them? Then you come to Acts chapter 5, verse 29 in our passage. Listen to this. Peter, in response to their threat, said, we ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Well, what are you trying to say, Manly? I'm trying to tell you that this whole idea of the Trinity God is involved in every facet of this. And it's God who raised him up. And it's the same God that you've been messing with for all your life. You've heard from the prophets that's back in the Old Testament. So we're not doing anything new here. So involved in the resurrection is the Spirit, is Christ himself, and is the Father himself. And all three members of the Trinity are aggressively, actively involved in even the resurrection from the dead. That's what's going on here. So the Father is moving, the Spirit is empowering, and Jesus is responding. The Trinity raised him. What does all of that mean? Look at the verse. He says, Let it be known to you all, to all the people of Israel, that by the name of, hear this, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified. So we've moved from a Trinity God of the Old Testament, not a new deal at all, to a tangible God. One you can reach out and touch. One you can interact with. One that doesn't come down on Mount Sinai and yell at you anymore. One that is, oh no, he's way out there, pillar of fire. We've moved into one who has come down here and has entered into the very essence of who we are. We talked a little bit about this last night. God had an idea in his mind and in his inner heart. And it looked just like you. You were his idea. Well, not exactly the way you are. You've done some things to yourself. But he had an idea. He had an idea in his mind and his heart. And he brought that into being. And his idea was man. And he created the first man and woman. This was his idea. Just the way he wanted them. They blew it big time. We're all aware of that. God said, my dream is that I can restore that. I'm going to put things back the way they were. Now, folks, if you calculate, according to our standard, if you calculate the number of years, God worked on that. This was really a big deal. See, if you've got a project that you've worked thousands of years on, I would think it probably really matters to you. And God rolled up his sleeves and went to work on doing what? This one single project. And that was the restoration of the dream that had gotten marred. The dream that was in his mind that had been marred in the life of man. And he said, I'm going, to, I'm going to start this whole thing all over again. This is phenomenal. I'm going to start this whole thing all over again. Only this time, I'm not creating myself a man. I'm going to become the man. And Jesus, the second member of the Trinity, leaped off his throne and set aside everything he had as God and became a helpless babe in a woman's womb and became the restoration. Here's the dream that God has in his mind for you. It looks just like Jesus. What is God's purpose for my life? (laughs) It looks just like Jesus. How does God want me to act? It looks just like Jesus. What kind of resource am I to have in my life? It looks just like Jesus. 
Everything that's going on in Jesus is to go on in you. Everything that Jesus knows is to go on in you. Everything, this is the idea in the mind and the heart of God. And he's restoring it. And it's all taking place in Jesus. And through the dynamic of the death and the resurrection and the ascension, what is happening? He is bringing forth a whole new breed of people, a whole new species of individuals who fulfill, look like, are this dream, this idea in the mind of God. That's you. You're not an average person. You've been born from above. You're not just doing the best you can. The very dynamic of the life of God has been implanted within you and birthed you. You're not just another guy, another gal. Don't you understand? Something has happened so powerfully that what's going on in the mind of God has now come to inject itself into you and all the resource of God has been released in your system to birth you into the fullness of all of his dream. And folks, this is not a finger in your face. This is not a, this is not a put down. This is a come on, people. Do you know what we can be? Do you know what God, God's dream can be? You can be the person you ought to be. You can live like you ought to live. You, hey, you can think like you ought to think. You can know what you ought to know. You can be the person you ought to be. God has determined it. And how do I know that? Because there's a Jesus that God has raised from the dead. That's how I know that. And he did it in this Jesus. Now it's very necessary to make one, one step in this. To grasp one thing. And that is the focus is not on the crucifixion. The focus is not on the resurrection. The focus is on Jesus. See, if the focus is on crucifixion, then anybody could be crucified and it would work. But not anybody could be crucified. It was Jesus who was crucified. So it isn't just about crucifixion. Because lots of people have been crucified, folks. and Didn't do anything for you or me. It was Jesus. It's this Jesus that matters. It's this Jesus who's the first one. It's this Jesus who has the possibility. It's this Jesus who has, is the beginning of this. It's this Jesus who's injecting life into the human form. It's this Jesus who's bringing redemption into the life of man. It's this Jesus who's knocking a hole in the wall where there is no door. Who's making a door where there is no door. It's this Jesus who's setting this thing up. It isn't just crucifixion. It's Jesus who's been crucified. It isn't just resurrection. Lots of guys have been raised from the dead. Lazarus was raised from the dead it isn't just anybody who's being raised from the dead it's Jesus who's been see the whole focus is on this that's why we talk about him all the time because he's the whole deal and he's the tangible reach out and whack grab a hold of actually marched, actually moved, actually stomped into our world, actually knocked a hole in the wall, actually invaded territory, actually went where nobody's ever gone. He's the one that set the whole thing up. He is the tangible God who's brought this into being. And the whole focus is on Jesus. Jesus. That's the emphasis of the passage. Now, Take that idea and march into verse 12. Nor is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name among he uh, 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 under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. 
That's so narrow. I know. Well, we're all, hey, all religions are going in this. No, they're not. Uh, we're all on different roads where we're going to end up. No, we're not. See, there's only one. Well, how can you say that? I'm not saying it. He did. Are we on track? There is no redemption outside of this one man. There is no other way to get in outside of this one. There is no other way to get in. There is no other door. There is no other possibility. This is not multiple choice. And the reason is, it isn't just crucifixion. It's this one man. It isn't just resurrection. It's this one man. And this Trinity God has literally leaped off His throne and become man and has literally walked among us. And God the Father, through the Spirit, has been acting in the man called Jesus. And this one single man is the only possibility. Boy, I'm going to have fun with this in the days ahead. Well, how do you know that, Manly? And how will the world know it? Well, that's the rest of the verse. It's the testimony of God. Look at the end of the verse, verse 10. By him, this man stands here before you whole. This is not theology. This is not preacher talk. This is Right there is the lame beggar who's no longer lame and who's been made whole. And he's been that way. He was that way for 40 years. He's over 40 years of age. You've known him. There's no question. A notable, if you read on in the passage, it says a notable miracle had been done and they couldn't say anything about it. And right there, God, did, isn't it interesting? that God picked an individual of the lowest status of society, beggar. Isn't it interesting that God picked someone poverty level? Isn't it interesting God picked someone low in education? Isn't it interesting God picked someone who had no personal benefits isn't it interesting that God reached inside of a life that it was totally absolutely helpless spiritually and physically and by the time he got done with the guy wham he was made whole and Peter says what I just told you about the one man, the Trinity God, acting in the one man is true because of... That's what we need around here. Somebody comes up and says, Manly, you, you mouth off, prove it to me. And I simply go... And we're the proof. This is why we're winning our community right and left. This is why they're flocking to our doors. Because we're the living proof that the Trinity God is acting in the man called Jesus and is birthing a whole new breed of humanity and we're the living proof and you can get in on it.
Jesus. You're not looking for the highly educated. Not that you would bypass them. It's just that education is not on your list. You're not looking for the wealthy. Not that you would bypass the wealthy. It's just that wealth isn't on the list. You're not looking for the talented. And it isn't that you would bypass the talented. It's just that that's not on your list. You're not looking for those who have something to contribute to you. And it isn't that you wouldn't take the contribution. It's just that that's not on your list. You're looking for anybody, any place, anywhere who will admit their helplessness, open themselves to you, and become a demonstration of the divine activity of a Trinity God that's been acting from beginning of the fall all the way to this moment, plotting, planning with a dream in his mind to restore mankind to his fullness, to the full extent, the full stature of what he's dreamed we could be. And you don't do a half job, do you? You don't, you don't do a token thing. You don't kind of repair. You don't put band-aids on, do you, Jesus? You birth. You bring new life. You create. Could you move into my helplessness? And could you radically, Trinity God, through the person of Jesus, oh Father, through the person of Jesus, empowered by the Spirit, could you literally revolutionize my thought process? Could you take me out of my box, out of my traditions, out of my security, out of what I cling to, well, out of the way I've always been? And could you explode who you are? Not a new deal. Hey, you're not, it's not risky. Not a new deal. It's the old deal. But God, I've boxed you up. I've put you in limits. I've put you, I, I, I've put boundaries around you. Would you explode in my life to expand, to move? Could I turn you loose to birth in me your dream, your idea? Heads are bowed. Hey, you don't have to. You can be the way you've always been. You can maintain. Hey, life isn't good, but then it's your life. And if you're secure in your misery, you could risk. You could step out by faith. You could allow him to extend your borders. You could listen beyond your theology. You could expand and let his dream be birthed in you. And the passage leaves me without excuse. Because there's no status of life lower than a lame beggar. If he could do it for him, he can do it for me. I want to seek him with me today. Would you step out of your securities, your traditional securities, your theological securities, your performance securities? Would you allow him to birth a new thing in your life, his dream? Be obedient.